Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious speck of silicon lore, while I tinkered, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my study door. Tis the wind, I muttered, tapping at my study door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember it. It was in the bleak October, and my mind, a restless ember, wrestled with performance lore. Eagerly I saw tomorrow, free from lag and techie sorrow. As I wrestled with this question, troubling me to my core, how could dual cores in 2024 still be worth anything more? And the silken, sad, uncertain noise of fans inside the chassis thrilled me, no, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. For the truth I knew was creeping, in my benchmark subtly seeping, that a dual core might be reaping numbers not seen before. How could this old form of yore perform well as I explore? Please forgive the Theater Kit intro, but I can barely contain my excitement. We're talking about something very near and dear to me today. When you say handheld PC, your mind probably conjures up images of the Steam Deck, ROG Ally, or Lenovo Legion Go, bespoke PC gaming handhelds that have taken the market by storm at this point. But it was only a few short years ago when the term meant something else entirely. When you said PC handheld, devices like the GPD Win 2 were poster children for that market segment. Heck, even go back further and you'll find devices like the Sony Vio P and OQL Model 2. Amazing pieces of kit that paved the way for handheld computing, but they were often limited by the technology of their time. Fast forward to today, and companies like One Netbook are keeping the concept alive with modern hardware and software capabilities. Their One Mix series is part of a line of ultra-compact laptops aimed at professionals, gamers, and travelers. The product line has come a very long way, with us up to the One Mix 5 now, a 12th gen powered 10 inch laptop. Still a great performer, but we're not going to be focusing our attention there today. No, we're going to be looking at something a little bit more, how you say, pedestrian. I present to you all the One Mix 2, the device that every UMPC enthusiast was clamoring for back in 2018. I wanted this one so bad, but man, I was just a broke college student at the time. No monies. So. What exactly is the One Mix 2? At its core, it's a 7-inch ultra-portable PC running Windows 10, and it's powered by the Intel Core M38100Y processor, a dual-core chip based on Intel's Amber Lake Y architecture. The key specs are as follows. The processor is, of course, the Intel Core M38100Y, which is a dual-core 4-thread processor with a 1.1 GHz base and a turbo of 3.4. For your RAM, you have 8GB of LPDDR3, then for storage, there's a 256GB PCIe SSD. The display is a 7-inch touchscreen with a 1920x1200 resolution and a 323 PPI. For the battery, it's a 6500 mAh unit offering 6-8 uh, hours of battery life, but more on that later. For the OS, it's of course running Windows 10, and it is technically compatible with Windows 11, but uh, it's, that's kind of shaky. Then for your weight, it's 515 grams and it's a full aluminum body, 180 degree hinge, which is super, super nice. So the One Mix 2 as a package still looks as good as the day it launched. Look at that slim profile, those clean lines, and that stellar port selection. You get one USB-A port with bog standard 3.0 speeds. Then next to it is a micro HDMI port, which is fine. It's not my favorite port, but at this size, can you really complain about it? You then have a full function USB-C port, which does support peripherals. At this time, you would see a few companies sneak USB-C ports on devices, but only for power, not data. Glad to see one netbook didn't cheap out back then. Then you have a UHS-1 class SD card reader, so up to 100 megabytes of second. And last but certainly not least, a combo headphone and mic jack. So awesome to see companies have the courage to keep these ports around. In some ways, it feels like we're going backwards in terms of I.O. selection on modern devices. In the pursuit of ever thinner laptops, you lose some tactility when you remove ports. Oh, speaking of thin and light. With its featherweight profile coming in at a little over 500 grams, the One Mix 2 feels incredibly portable. It's all solidly constructed, so you don't feel like you're going to break it if you drop it. It's a very dense package. The team gets top marks in engineering, but what about usability? Yeah. 
Let's talk about that now. What's it like to type on this thing? Let's not beat around the bush. The typing experience is extremely compromised. It's compromised to the point where I'm not even sure where to begin. So I guess I'll just start with the keyboard size. From key to key, you're looking at a typing area of about 17 centimeters, with key travel of about a millimeter, if that. It's a very shallow and mushy typing experience. On my HP Pavilion 14 Plus, typing on those keys gives off a nice subtle bounce. You can hear and feel it. I love this style of keyboard because it helps me to not only type quicker, but get a better sense of where keys will be. It feels like I'm gliding from key to key. On the One Mix 2, there's a click and a bounce, but they're both soft. It feels like you're settling into a gelatinous mass. If you want to experience this sensation at home, then try this. Pour a small drop of grape jelly on your kitchen counter, then press down into it. That much before the counter is exactly how this feels. I am not a fan. Then there's the actual posturing of this device, which I also struggled with. I wanted to test this as someone who might use it seriously, so on a desk and on my lap. The desk experience was serviceable. I was able to type documents and browse around on the comically small optical mouse pointer, but it wasn't a quick experience. I felt like I was doing a lot of hunting and pecking, the sort of typing experience you'd find on a cell phone, only a lot slower because of the physical keys. But typing on my lap? Ooh, I would not recommend, especially for the guys in my audience, which according to my YouTube stats is, well, 100% of you. The small profile means you need an equally small area to rest the device on. So if you're like me and your legs naturally sway out, you then need to close your legs and essentially keep them glued together if you want any hope of getting mobile work done. It's so uncomfortable like this, and especially so when the device gets hot because, well, yeah, working this thing will cause it to get toasty. Oh, so I suppose it's time to talk about performance now. Let's get to the heart of the matter. How usable is a dual core system like the One Mix 2 in 2024? In a world where most laptops are sporting quad core, hexa core, octa core, or even dodeca core processors, is a dual core system enough for Windows tasks? Before going forward though, we need to define our workloads. What would someone use a device like this for anyway? Well, it's small and extremely portable, so I imagine this person does a lot of traveling. For a road warrior, I imagine they'd be doing a lot of document writing, watching movies, streaming, perhaps some light photo editing, and even lighter gaming. Those are a decent and reasonable spread of tasks I could see someone wanting to use this device for. Though I have my concerns, it's still two cores under Windows 10. Even the fastest dual cores would struggle under the weight of this OS, right? Well, we idle at about 40% utilization doing nothing. So yeah, it's not looking too good. Though, let me not jump the gun. We need to get a baseline going. Now, I'm not a raving Cinebench fan, but I think it can help us get a bit of a foundation on CPU performance. I started with the multi-core test. You know, to give the four threads a fighting chance. The test took 12 minutes to complete, but when it did, we got a score of 1149 points. For comparison, the 8100Y's nearest neighbor was the i7-1165G7, a four-core eight-thread Tiger Lake chip that scored over 3K. So yeah, a bit of a gulf between us at the bottom and the next highest scoring chip. Let's rip the band-aid right off and look at single core now. This test took nearly 22 minutes to complete, but once it did, we got a score of just 631, which is apparently better than the Xeon X5 650. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that one, but I don't have any platforms like that to confirm. Either way, we can see what we're working with a bit better now. For testing real world tasks, I decided to get the lighter stuff out of the way first. The things I knew for a fact this chipset would have no issues with. So, document editing. It does it fine. I use WPS Office, but no matter what you use, it will work A-OK. -okay. This isn't even much of a test as it is a delayment of the inevitable. I'm not really looking forward to running the heavier stuff on this guy, though time marches on. Next we have web browsing and streaming all lumped into one test. I'm using Edge because despite what some may have you to believe, it actually is a very RAM efficient browser. With that said, the caveat is that it's not easy on the iGPU. Pages with lots of images and moving elements will stall and take their sweet time loading. Loading YouTube is a slog. In the time it takes to load this one web page, I could have gotten my master's in computer engineering, gotten a fellowship at Intel, worked on the CPU architecture itself, gotten laid off, 
and taking my work experience to make my own CPU. And that CPU would probably be faster than this one. All that to say, it's slow. Even once cache is built up. As for actual video playback, that works fine enough. 1080p playback is smooth, with only a few dropped frames, and it's the same store with 4K. You could conceivably watch a movie or show like this and have a good time. Web browsing is a similar story to YouTube's initial loading, just a lot of pain when you have pages with lots of moving elements and images. It's doable, but not exactly pleasant. Now on to some of the heavier stuff. Photo editing actually wasn't too bad with Movavi Photo Editor. This is a very lightweight editor and pretty basic with its feature set too. Background removal doesn't do too much to stress the system, and neither does any other setting. Though this is because the program itself is efficient in this regard, and uses very few CPU cycles. If anything, the RAM is stressed the most here. Okay, so originally I was going to show video editing here in this next segment, but then I thought about it, and that's silly. No, it's kind of stupid. You don't want to do any video editing on a dual core system in 2024. It's out of the question. That's like using your phone to calculate protein folding. Could you probably do it? Maybe. Would you want to? A resounding no. So let's move on to something that you would realistically actually like to do on this device. The gaming test did not start off by giving me much confidence. I tried to run Steam Big Picture mode and the iGPU failed to render much of anything on screen. So I immediately revised my test suite and started with the lighter titles first. Lego Indiana Jones, one that I know will run on a potato PC. Uh, it didn't work. I kept getting a fail to create D3D device error. This one was just too much for the scope of this video to dig into. Now, I'm not one to shy away from a challenge, but there was much more work and test to be done, so I had to scrap it. With that failed, next on my suite was Alan Wake 1. Now, I knew for a fact that the CPU portion of the chip will be able to play this game at minimum specs, but the iGPU was a lot more of a variable. I was able to get to the title screen before getting another graphics related error and crashing out. So this one was also a bust. Then next on my list was Max Payne 1, a game that while finicky is one that I've been able to get running on potatoes before. You can even get this to play perfectly on Steam Deck, so I had no doubt that it would be an easy launch, but no, it failed here too. Hardware rendering, software rendering, it didn't matter. Both types and all resolutions just caused the game to crash out. So I switched gears and jumped into some Source games. I started with the single player run of Left 4 Dead 2. Now I'm very happy to report that I was able to load and jump into killing zombies without any issues. I ran with default settings and the panel's native resolution, which netted me an average of 60 FPS with dips into the mid 50s when things got hectic. Though I was just happy to launch a 3D game and have it work. Working games, a commodity in these trying times. The performance is acceptable to me here, but the form factor makes it a miserable experience. You do not want to play any FPS game on this keyboard. Though, to be fair, this device was made with no gaming in mind, so I can't reasonably detract from the machine on that front. So I wanted to end on a higher note, and I tried to go for the gold. Half-Life 2 Lost Coast. I chose this over the main game due to size mostly. The performance profile is identical between both. This should have been a slam dunk, but of course, the game failed to launch here too. A very disappointing romp, but hey, at least Half-Life 1 worked. Now let's get under the hood. Disassembling the Winmix 2 is straightforward. Just a few screws and you can lift the back panel up. Due to this having all metal construction, there are no flimsy plastic clips to deal with. That is A plus design right there and I am so happy. Once it's open, you can see all the major components on display. And it's a pretty clean layout. The copper heat pipe covers the RAM module and SLC while the SSD chips are soldered off to the side. So first things first, that heat pipe is super flimsy. The device gets pretty toasty and the fans ramp up on the slightest CPU activity. I understand that for cost and space reasons, they couldn't develop a more robust solution, but this feels weak even for the time. That pipe is barely wicking any heat from the processor. It's just ridiculous. And of course, everything else is soldered down. And you know, that's not really something that I'm gonna gripe about when the device is this small and light, especially considering we got some very decent IO for the size. Now, the next point of interest is the 6500 milliamp hour battery, which equates to about 25 watt hours. 
a decent size for the amount of power the chip draws. I normally would do battery life testing, but wasn't able to do it with this unit because it has a severely degraded battery. It holds a charge, but you can tell that the cells are going out due to some sporadic low battery notices that we get, even after a full charge. I was never able to catch these on camera due to their random nature, but I'm telling you, they are there and it's bad news. Now I was going to replace this battery, but once I saw the prices for replacement batteries, it's um, you know, uh, something I'm gonna have to get back to. 90 bucks to have a battery this old shipped from overseas is just not something that I wanna fork over cash for right this second. I ended up doing a little maintenance and removing the heat pipe from the chassis. I wanted to clean up the processor and repaste it, you know, in hopes that we could keep temps down and the fans from aggressively spinning up every time we press the Windows key. Reassembly was easy and the device worked just fine afterwards. This is far from a repairable machine, but I will give credit where it's due. Having the same screw type all throughout the device was just a grade A choice. That combined with no plastic clips means opening and closing this thing was a breeze. I hope more manufacturers make a move towards making their devices user serviceable. It doesn't really hurt anybody. So what's the final verdict? In a world dominated by high performance multi-core processors, the One Mix 2 showcases an interesting paradigm. At the ultra low end where this device operates, CPU performance is not the bottleneck. Cores are fast enough for basic everyday tasks, especially for ones that operate within a browser. We're heavily GPU bound and it shows with all the issues we had today. Not being able to run most games, no video editing, poor website rendering and loading, that's all iGPU work. In the tech space, you hear a ton about CPU performance from the perspective of very high low tasks, rendering, advanced mathematical calculations, gaming, etc. You hear about these benchmarks and the average person will immediately assume that their CPU is the most important factor in their everyday computing experience. But that's just not the case anymore. We're in a time where your GPU is doing so much heavy lifting in the applications we use every day. Everything from web pages to mail clients are hardware accelerated by the GPU. So I say all that to say that today's video should be more of um, a hyperbolic demonstration. The era of needing a blazing fast CPU is behind us. If you're an average mixed usage kind of PC enthusiast, the kind of person who does it all on their computer, get a decent mid-range CPU. Something at the low end with at least 12 threads and focus your attention on a decent GPU. We're only going to be offloading more and more of the computing experience to it. And if you don't keep up, well, you'll end up with a less than usable experience like the one mixed to here. Truly suffering through the multi-cores of madness. I am the Silicon Fox, and I thank you for watching.